ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ ਕਲੱਬ ਆਫ ਕੈਨੇਡਾ ਜੋ ਕਿ ਇੱਕ ਸੰਸਥਾ ਹੈ ਅਸੀਂ ਉਹਦੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਚ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਅਕਸਰ ਦੱਸਦੇ ਰਹਿੰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਸਪੋਰਟ ਕਰਨੇ ਆ ਸਪੋਰਟ ਸਿਰਫ ਇਸ ਲਈ ਕਰਨੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਮੀਡੀਆ ਦੀ ਏਕਤਾ ਦੇਖਣਾ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਆ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਇਲਾਵਾ ਵੀ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਸੰਸਥਾਵਾਂ ਨੇ ਆਪਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਇੱਜ਼ਤ ਮਾਨ ਨਾਲ ਦੇਖਨੇ ਆ ਐਂਡ ਆਵਰ ਸਪੋਰਟ ਇਜ਼ ਫॉर एवरीबॉडी ਹੈਵਿੰਗ ਸੈਡ ਥੈਟ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ ਕਲੱਬ ਆਫ ਕੈਨੇਡਾ ਦੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੱਕ ਰਾਊਂਡ ਟੇਬਲ ਕਾਨਫਰੰਸ ਰੱਖੀ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਇਲਾਕੇ ਦੇ ਐਮਪੀ ਨੇ ਕਾਇਲ ਸੀਬੈਕ ਜੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ members of punjabi press club of canada paid him a visit this also happened this week assi ohna na back gal baat kiti silsila ohi jari rakhna hai ki assi ek dujje nu achhi tarah janiye samjhiye apni samasyaavan ohna nu dassiye te ohna de concerns suniye te apni communities tak puchaiye i hope you like this segment as well reason being we are a brampton based institution mm-hmm. and here we are to introduce ourselves uh, one by one i'll request my members to introduce you starting yeah, from singh matu from punjab gadi yes so this is singh from majdi bar great the and you are is from breakfast buzz <laughs> is bajin the temple from parastar video and telka tv great you in my car thank you Great. So here we are to introduce ourselves and discuss some issues that might benefit all and ask you that what your forthcoming plans are for the uplift of our communities and all communities for that matter and of Brampton in general. Well, I think that you know the most important thing uh, and we're certainly still talking about is the economy and you know uh, the economic recovery is still i think fairly fragile um we're seeing lots of difficulties uh with the european debt crisis um the american economy is still not where it once was uh so the economy is a big focus for our government because we know that that's the focus of canadians canadians want good paying jobs they want job security uh, they want lower taxes so you know the primary focus um for our government going forward is going to be the economy Uh, you know we look at that in a number of ways uh, we look at it in the sense of lowering taxes um, you may or may not know but as of january 1st of this year uh, we've lowered the federal corporate tax rate from uh, 16.5% to 15% and which has taken us from a federal corporate tax rate of around 21.5% to 15% so we're trying to create the uh, the uh, most favorable tax environment uh, in the G8 um and i think we're almost there and it makes it just a great competitive advantage against other countries that's a, a big part of it um and trade is another big part we're aggressively pursuing trade agreements i'm sure you're aware um we're uh, i think we're in the 8th or 9th round of negotiations now with uh with in CETA with the European Union that's a trade agreement that i find particularly exciting uh it's a gigantic market um be great for canadian businesses and why I like uh the 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 free trade with uh, the the European Union so much is because we enter into a competitive marketplace where you know you have similar wage and other costs um sometimes when you enter into free trade agreements we have a lot of concerns about you know there were a lot of concerns initially with Mexico and we lose jobs to Mexico because they pay workers so much less um so they might have an advantage When you look at the European Union they have very similar uh, wage environments, very similar cost inputs for energy and other things. So I think it's going to give us a great uh, a great opportunity. And you know, certainly for the Punjabi Press Club, uh, we're entering negotiations for uh, free trade with India. Now, when you think about that, when you think about where the relationship was between Canada and India 10 years ago, to imagine that we're now on the point of uh discussing and and negotiating free trade it's an amazing transformation you know 10 years ago there was still the the hangover from the uh, the nuclear issue between Canada and India relationships wasn't really moving forward now we've had you know uh, prime minister singh come to canada for high level discussions with prime minister harper and we're negotiating free trade i think it's it, it's a, it's a great advancement of that relationship so i think those are the primary focuses for us um my personal agenda has always been uh, community safety and crime so um safe streets and community act is in the senate i think at third reading um and will receive royal assent sometime uh in
in the new year, um, in the next month or so, and that's going to be a great tool for our police and our courts to make sure that we're toughening up on crime. So those are the two big things, I think, for me, uh, the economy and certainly community safety and crime. Right, sir. Um, there's a couple of questions that I know sometimes there are of your uh, uh, should we talk with Jason Kenny about this? Uh, this uh, we talk about the immigration issue and mm -hmm. so super visas, just like ordering fries from McDonald's. Would you like them super? Of course, you like them so much because you get a deal out of it. <laughs> now, people are thinking uh, it's not the super deal they wanted because uh, uh, Canada is always one of the United families. And when you bring uh, uh, with super visa, sure, it's a faster service for the parents to join their loved ones here, but they also leave their siblings behind, which is their kids, uh, the other uh, the other kids behind. Uh, I think that's a very big impact. In impact on the, on the family side is to decide if they have they have two kids in India, they got a kid over here, they want to come over, but the only, only mom and dad can come over. Um, any, any, any new changes to come up to bring the whole family over rather than just bringing uh, the mother and father over and stuff like that? Well, I think, you know, to talk about super visas, I think, I think they're great. Uh, so, and I'll, and I'll get to the second part of your question, but super visas are great because they're going to be processed in about eight weeks. Um, so you get a decision on whether or not you're eligible or you, you're able to receive the super visa. You can come into Canada stay up to 24 months. Um, it's multiple entry over 10 years, uh, which is going to really give uh, parents and grandparents the freedom to come and go into Canada as they please. I think people in the Punjabi community know that one of the, the, um, the difficult things is the ability to get a visitor's visa. Sometimes people who, you know, a parent or a grandparent who's received a visitor's visa in the past and then returned, uh, within the, the before the visa expired, the next time they apply, for some strange reason, they didn't get the visa. Now that doesn't happen all the time, but it certainly has happened. And so, <clears throat> from my discussions with people, certainly in the Punjabi community, it's not necessarily that the parents want to come and live in Canada, but the difficulty with the visitors' visas leads them to apply for permanent residency so that they can come and go as they please when they once they're sponsored and they're accepted. So I think. The super visa is going to alleviate a lot of that strain um, for people to allow them to come and go as they please. They can still apply for permanent residency if they want. Uh, and I think it's going to be a great program for, uh, for people who are trying to spend time with their parents. Um, with respect to brothers and sisters, I'm not an expert on uh, family reunification, but my understanding is that family reunification is really, there's certain, there's th three different sort of categories. Um, there's spousal and children. Right? So if you're here and you want to sponsor your spouse and children to come over, that's one category and that's the priority category for our government because we think that families in the sense of a husband and wife and children, they should be reunited first. And then you get into the other categories which are FC4 class, parents and grandparents. So you can sponsor your parents and grandparents to come. I'm not aware that there's a program that allows you to bring brothers and sisters. I think they have to apply on their own and, and be granted immigration to Canada. And I don't think that that's I don't think that that's a problem. I, to me, it doesn't make sense that our that our immigration program is if one family member becomes eligible to come to Canada, then every brother, every sister is able to come as well. Um, I think the, the system works the way it is. Whoever gets to come here, they can sponsor their spouse, their children, uh, or their parents and their grandparents, and that to me is is a fair system. And also because, you know, the other categories have been increased, for example, the students. So the younger brothers and sisters, they're actually uh, easily can come to Canada through that category. And under, even under the skills category. So we are improving that uh, as well. Yeah. I'm going to ask one more question before I let these guys have their, sure. have their chance. So, um, I get a lot of calls. There's people who have been here for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I met a couple of them. Um, uh, they're willing to uh, dish in the money whatever the government allows, 10,000, 20,000, 15,000. And they've been here uh, living and working, but they can't get the permanent residence yeah, and, and they can't get the visa to go back to India. These guys have no criminal records. Uh, I really feel um, um, you know, in whatever way they came to Canada is, is that's what I have investigated. But these guys have been here working in Canada for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. They haven't seen their families and they haven't seen their relatives. They want to go back or they can't get the visa to go uh, go uh, go back. And they're willing to dish in the money that costs the Canadian government to give them whatever looking for immigration. And these are good people working for Canada making money and they want to pay their pay their dues and, and, and get, the, get the visa stamped so they can go back and come back to this country again. It, 
is I, I know uh, is there a process we can uh, help these guys quicker? These guys waited for 10 or 15 years. I'm not I'm not sure what the problem is because it doesn't take 10 or 15 years to uh, apply for permanent residency and be granted. So if they've applied for permanent residency and they still have not been granted permanent residency in 10 or 15 years, they should come into my office and, and meet with us because we could we could probably figure out what the problem yeah. is if if they're here. Um, with no status, yeah. meaning they came here perhaps uh, illegally um, and they don't have any status and now they want to get status, that's a much more complicated process. And you know, I'd certainly be willing to meet with them to try and figure out what their status is and how we can help them. But I have to say that this is the problem that, that you know, a lot of Western countries have. You have people that come here, um, and I'm not saying this is the case, but yeah. Sometimes if people come here illegally, they sort of live off the grid, so to speak. Um, the government doesn't know they're here. They get established, they get married, they have children, and then they say, uh, I want to be able to travel back and forth, and I want to become a full status Canadian. Well, that's a really difficult, you put the government in a very difficult position. Because if you say to people, you can come here illegally, and as long as you work and do a few things, we'll naturalize you as a citizen. Well, that tells everybody to come to the country illegally because you just get naturalized. So it puts the government in a very difficult position. How do you deal with people that have come here illegally and then you know built a good life in this country? I know the U.S. struggles with it, right? They, there's lots of talks about big amnesties because they have a lot of uh, people from Mexico who have come in and, and they're talking about these things. We're talking about what to do with those people as well, but I don't think we have a decision yet. Um, it's something we're going to have to come to grips with. But um, on an individual basis, I'd be happy to meet okay. those oh, That's good. So I can set up a meeting with, with them and see, see. I don't know their views, how, how they came over, yeah. but they've been yeah. always calling yeah. and finding out. So we'll that's right. For, for sure. That sounds great. Uh, Mr. Sivek, uh, there's a report yesterday in the media that top 100 CEO of a bigger corporation or bigger company they are uh, they made in 2010 189 extra whatever the average person making in, in uh, Canadian society uh, what are the conservative uh, government thinking to close the gap or just uh, sometime we can think <coughs> they announce they are favoring more uh, tax uh, to those bigger corporations yeah I think you know I think this, the report actually was that by noon yesterday, the top CEOs in the country have already earned more than the average Canadian wage for the entire year. Absolutely. Uh, right? So, uh, you know, look, I think that um, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult for most Canadians to accept that somebody can earn $40,000 uh, a, a day uh, as the CEO of a company. Um, the problem you have is these are private companies, and uh, private companies are responsible to shareholders. And the shareholders are the ones who are going to determine whether or not that's an acceptable wage to pay a CEO. I think you enter into really dangerous territory when you have government determining uh, what private companies can pay their, their top executives. Uh, because then, you, you know, companies are going to have to start thinking about, boy, we, uh, we can't pay our CEOs a certain amount. There's a limit on it. Um, should we be operating in Canada? So. You know, I think it's a dangerous uh, situation to say government should legislate whether or not private companies can pay CEOs what they want. It's a very different story um, with, with uh, public uh, corporations. I know we've seen reports recently in, the, in Ontario uh, where some of our crown corporations, the people there are making, you know, very large salaries with very large perks. Now that's something I think that we should absolutely look at. Uh, very true. Because when you're taking public money, um, you know, should somebody who's taking public money earn, you know, a hundred times what the average Canadian wage is? Uh, I, I'm not so sure they should. So I think we would but, definitely but want to look at also, government that. is more favored to give tax relief to corporation that they can do a little bit less than uh, less favor than. Well, are. you know, we've lowered we've lowered personal income tax rates in this country. We've lowered the GST. Uh, we now have the lowest federal tax on individuals since the 1950s. So we have really taken strides to reduce taxes for average Canadians. You know, P, you know, some people may agree or disagree, but as conservatives we believe that by lowering taxes for corporations that spurs economic growth, right? Ta corporations pay less tax, 
They're able to invest in productivity by investing in machinery or equipment or other ways to be more competitive. We are in a, you know, in a global economy and we face, our corporations compete against corporations that are all, you know, located in Mexico or, or Singapore where the, where the average uh, labor input is one-tenth what they have here in Canada. So how are you able to compete with that? Well, you know, our view is that by having low taxes, those corporations, when they're having good years, pay less tax than perhaps those corporations do, and therefore they can invest in new machinery, new equipment, be more productive, and therefore have that kind of a competitive advantage. So, uh, you know, low taxes for everyone is, is a conservative core value.